Mario Cruz. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Mario Cruz. And the co-founder of TTO of Choose Digital. Um, today, I'm going to talk about continuous development. I'm going to talk about automation and innovation. I'm going to talk about some things at very high levels. Sometimes I'll take a deep dive technical for a little bit. But I'm going to keep it pretty high level. I am very technical, so if you have any questions after, you can ask me questions after. If uh, you want to see me after the talk, I'll be more than happy to catch up with you. I wanted to make it across the board something everybody can understand. Um, I want to show you some of the things we're doing on cloud music. <coughs> cloud business doesn't even know what we're doing until for a long time. So I want to sort of be broad and have this room also be part of that community. So just a quick uh, count here. How many people run their own Jenkins internally? How many run it hosted? All right. Okay. So a little bit about myself. Um, I started in network engineering on routers, security, Cisco, Microsoft, I have lots of certs. Then I became a developer, I wrote lots of code. Then I got to IT operations, I lost lots of sleep. Then I got to IT security and did a lot of smoke and mirrors. So just a quick background, I started hacking, got into networking, got into DevOps, but now I'm the pointy hair boss. <laughs> so that's the career path of an IT guy. So you go from the IT guy to the pointy hair boss somehow, and one day, uh, so how many folks here manage their Jenkins installation or the, or the lead or the manager for the group? All right, awesome, that's what we go by. So I, I work for Choose Digital, and what we've done is we built this pretty incredible platform. It runs almost completely on cloud today in Jenkins. We host over 7 million you know, MP3s, we have most major movies and TV shows, we have recommended books. What we basically run is a white label iTunes store. We work for brands like United, SkyMall, Marriott, where you can use your points, or you can use your miles actually to buy content, like you would on Amazon or iTunes, or you can use the cash and earn miles and points. Okay? Um, we are a sponsor today, but I am not a vendor, so I'm going to show you two more slides about what I do, and then I'm going to show you exactly what I do with the actual tools. We have uh, a set of tools that are basically we have APIs that we, you know, we have, so if anybody's interested in Hosting a white label solution, you can see me after. But uh, we have full APIs, we do white labels, uh, we do a lot of app development. Here's some of the things that's United, that's Big O, that's JCPenney. If you Google Mario Cruz and CloudBees, you'll find that I, a third of my tweets and a third of my blog posts are about continuous development, DevOps, and CloudBees. I am the biggest fanboy there is at, uh, for CloudBees and Jenkins. Uh, so some of the guys that I, I know from from Todd Bees here, here today, I've only met in person today, but we've been talking for about three years with the customer. Um, I have huge respect for KK and Sasha and Andre and the marketing team. They put together a phenomenal product. And I think it's really important that um, we understand how these things work together. I'm going to be very focused on the Todd Bees side today because I think it's a secret sauce that people don't know about. Um, and I think one of the things we saw in the talk today on the enterprise side of Jenkins and on workflow. And, and a lot of things that are actually coming down the pipe. There's better ways to do it than to do it yourself. We all talk about build, test, and deploy. Um, I think it's why we're all here. We all believe it. I don't think if we didn't, we wouldn't be here. Just a typical day at our, at our company, when any developer pushes to a branch, a build is automatically fired. We run a pretty big test. Um, so if you can see, this is something we just started about 10 days ago. It went from three tests to 50 tests in about a 90 period. We are big on tests because our QA um, turnaround is usually about 24 to 48 hours. Right? We want to have the QA piece very small. If you really want to get into continuous development and you really want to say, I live it, you got to live it. You, you can't be you know, half pregnant. Either you're, are you a continuous development shop or you're not? Right? And this is uh, where if and so I hear this a lot because I, 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 I talk to a lot of friends and a lot of folks are doing this. You say, yeah, we're DevOps and we work at this development. But if your developer is building a build for himself on his machine that only he has, that's not considered this development. You failed. Right? He can have his own branch. He can have his own branch on Jenkins. But if he has his own build that he's testing, you have failed with your continuous development. I would say that this is where I am a huge copy proponent because I'll talk about that. But if you have anything that not everybody's touching, that's where things the dreaded conflicts happen. I don't care what source code you use or what pull, you know, conflicts suck. And they're a killer of time, innovation, right? And frankly, they're a killer of use because everybody's gonna fight who's code survives, 
Right foot, here's good. That never works. So if you're constantly pushing, you're constantly building, you're never a couple hours behind. And then when those come up, at the beginning of the end of the day, it's only that day's work. Now, well, I don't remember what I worked four weeks ago because on my bill, it works. Right? This is, so all you've done is say, it's the network guy's fault, it's the database guy's fault, it's the machine's fault to say it. It works on my bill. Right? So all we do is move the blame somewhere else. If you're DevOps, if you're continuous dev, you're constantly pushing. When all the tests pass, it's pushed. It automatically goes to production on our site. The developer looks at it after the build is done. Um, we have a couple of tools that we use out of the box, out of the copies on the enterprise side. They automatically email everybody when the build is done. It automatically emails you when the build has failed. When the build fails, right, I have it to, now it tells you when it failed, it shows you a copy of all the test jobs. Um, if you're the one that wrote the test, it actually puts you on the top of the list, right, and everybody else you see. So those are one of the tools that we've done. So again, hopefully everybody's doing this, and everybody's living this, right? All we've done is automate this, right? But that's not gonna get you to, to be fast, right? So now that you've automated what we call the sausage making part, right? You gotta get to what really makes a difference, which is the innovation piece. So the innovation piece comes from a few things, right? The biggest thing for me for innovation pieces was not hosting my own Jenkins, right? I don't wanna, I don't wanna host Jenkins, right? If you have a guy that invented Jenkins here today talking about the enterprise, they run the biggest, biggest configuration and set up for, for Jenkins. So who do you think is have more experience? Me and my company? Or the guys at Cloudy that do this and do this, right? I don't want to do that. Right? This is where this is what we all suffer from. Everybody in this room suffers from this, myself too, right? And we'll talk about some of the things we suffer from, which is we think we can do everything because we're smart people. And smart people suffer from smart people. Uh, this is something I'll talk about where well, I can do it in five minutes, you know, five hours later. It's like the, you've heard of the free phone you or the free cat or the free puppy. It's not the upfront cost that I tell you. It's the long-term cost, right? Anybody give you a free puppy up front, because they well, I've got a brand new puppy, you know? It's a $1,000 dog? Yeah, but you got to live that dog that's down the lifetime of feeding it, taking care of it, doing the vet, right? Nobody thinks of those, the ROI, the optics, and the tactics. So to do this, we have developers have a lot of control in our company, okay? The way this is done is, if you show up to a meeting and you have a four-page spec, it's not going to get built. Because if you have a four-page spec, I would tell you, anybody that shows up to your meeting with a four-page spec, run away. Because what's happened is they thought, they thought of everything already. And so what that does, it pigeonholes the developer, right, or the PM, or the VI, or the VA, right, to say, this is what I have to put. So all you order is a pizza, right? But that's it. But what happens when people, when something goes wrong, Right? All you have is a pizza. If you bring the developer into the room earlier, right, when the spec is being built, it's a one page spec. Um, there's a lot of talk at the last couple of Amazon conferences, a couple of talk on, um, people have talked about it like Adrian and some of the guys. If you want a product, you have to, want, for our company, you write a one page, right, press release. And if you keep out the top of the head and you put the foot of the, our company, you basically have two paragraphs to write what you want. If it's a function, if it's a feature, or if it's a product. If it doesn't fit on a page, I don't want it. I don't want you to think about what the use cases were. I don't want you to think about all the business rules. I want you to tell me, here's what I want, not how to do it. That's the difference of a spec, right? The spec should be, here's what I want to get to, not how to get to it. And if you tell me how to get to it, you've taken the developer's opinion out of it, you've taken his experience out of it, you've taken all the years that he, that he has in programming out of it. Does that make sense? The people in the room? So, what you should do is tell me what you want. You know, as people say, tell me about the baby, not the birth, you know, not the, not the birth. I, I, I don't care. I just want to see the baby. I don't care how long. Is it five hours, nine hours, ten hours? It's going to affect the baby, right? Five years from now. So those are the things you want to do. Now, that requires a huge amount of trust in your developer. Now, everybody's cut out for this. I will tell you that back to half pregnant, or half to, I, I started the DevOps, I started the community development. Where it doesn't work, is when there's no trust, right? Because what happens is, everybody goes off to do something, and everybody's doing their part of the spec, and somebody said, here's what I want in this feature, and you go build it, and you're really, there's, I, I would say it, it happens on most sides of the spectrum. You have the hero guy that writes all the super code that nobody can interfix. You have the guy that writes the shitty code that nobody can interfix. They're, for me, they're both the same. The hero and the shitty guy are like identical to me. Because at the end of the day, it, it, it would take me as much time to fix it 
as anything else, right? So trust me, you'll find a lot of heroes in companies that say this DevOps thing is bull. I've been, you know, I've been doing build on a machine for years. It works on my machine. I can build anywhere. Those days are gone, right? Here, if you push, when you push GitHub in our site, if you're on a train, it doesn't matter because once you push it, the cloud big jobs take off. It does the builds, right? It does the test. It puts it in production. Right, so they look, oh, I don't have the time, I don't have the CPU, I don't have the bandwidth. If you have a job that takes, you know, I don't, you know this morning when KK asked how many people had a job for three days, I don't think I could wait three days for a job, because I'm pretty impatient. But some of our jobs, like two of our processing jobs for uh, encoding of uh, video, take about four and a half hours. And some of the workflow you've seen today, we've built some of that today, and I'll show you how we've done that. But that's where the trust piece comes in, right? If somebody's going to wait three hours for a build and not be productive, it better be good. So this comes with the blame this culture, right? So if you have the hero or you have the guy that sucks, you have to get rid of him. Because what happens is blame and I'm learning is an excuse for not delivering. Right? The two biggest excuses for not shipping is I'm learning something or it's not working. Right? Or I don't have enough time or the feature's not right. It, again, I mean I would say that shipping and continuous development and DevOps, all those should become one big thing. And to do that, it has to be, it has to be blameless. If you walk into your team meeting and people are pointing fingers, this is where the problem comes earlier on conflicts. The conflict is where a lot of things get resolved because some of the best conversations you have with the developer is on the conflict. Why did you do it that way? And you know, maybe maybe after the conversation, it's already factored, not that stuff gets thrown away anyways, right? That's a time to say, how can we do better? What can we do better? What was your thought process here? What's my thought process there? Right? And we've all heard Mark Anderson say that, you know, software can eat the world. Everybody in this room is a chef, right? You guys can make that happen, right? You, the people that's going to make this be the next big thing. Three years ago, when I started using Cloudbees and Jenkins, I mean, you talk about who was using Jenkins, and it was like percentage of single digits. Now I think, I, I want to say it's 100%, but it's close, okay? Everybody knows what Jenkins is, everybody knows what CIs are, everybody knows what you're getting. But to do that, it's important to come back to what I talked about earlier, right? It is, we all suffer from the smart disease. I can build that, right? Why do I want to, why do I want to have something that somebody else does or host it, right? Or why do I want to use it at Cloudbees hosted Jenkins, or why do I want to use a run cloud, or whatever? Why do I want to use some of those features? It's because if you're small, it doesn't matter. But nobody should be thinking small here. We've never had the power to change anything we wanted that we do today. Compute is cheap, cheap, cheap. Compute power today is cheaper than buying an iPhone, right? So think about that. You can get on Cloudbees today and run a free app, you know, for nothing, and not get charged anything, and have that power, the compute power. You can have a Jenkins job, build a job. You can have it free on the lowest, lowest tier, and it's not cost you anything, right? So you guys that will have a great idea, a great option. So there's no excuse of why that should be done, or why you should do that. To do them on your own. And we all suffer from that because folks say, well, I can do it in five minutes, I can do it in five days. And that's not where the cost comes in. The cost comes in when you become busier or when you want to innovate. This is where the innovation comes, right? With this technical debt, you've heard it as technical debt, you've heard it as work in progress. That's the thing that kills me. I can't work on my next feature because now I'm patching my Jenkins or I'm patching my servers or I'm making sure that my puppet chef is doing the build correctly here. That will eat you. And it sounds, like, it sounds like it's not cheap, but if your goal is to, to scale quickly, have someone else do it. And this is where, if you, if you Google me in CloudBees or DevOps, you'll hear that I say this all the time. If it's not core to your business, you should be doing none of it. If it's not what differentiates you, you from your competitor, you should be doing none of it. Zero, 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 zero. And that sounds crazy, but it is, because whatever your expertise is today won't be the domain expertise of the guys you're buying it from. I will never have the domain expertise. I think I'm a Jenkins expert, right? I sat at this conference today, and I saw three guys, and it blew my mind, right? And I think, I don't have that domain experience. But none of those guys have the domain experience that Cloudbees has with Jenkins. They're running over 4,000 slaves, 6,000 slaves. I don't know what the number is today. It's a huge amount of slaves running in Cloudbees for the enterprise side of the business. And they have the best plugins for the enterprise. They have the best tools. And you saw a workflow today on the enterprise. Those kind of innovation will never come from me because I'm busy working on whatever the next request just came in. So I have two choices, innovate or work on working for Jenkins, 
right? That's, that's where I have to cut my costs, right? You have a choice here. I can, I can go to CloudBeast and have this offloaded, and I never have to worry about co-hosting Jenkins again, right? Or I can say every six months, I have an array of couple of passes, a couple of things. I'm not saying don't give to the community, because that's the difference. When you give to the community, everybody gives to the community, so everybody, see, everybody gets that benefit. The benefit of the community is there, right, without having to you can do it yourself. So how do we do this, right? Everything on this slide is what I do at, with Hobbies today, with Jenkins. I run 90% of my business off of Hobbies, right? I have basically 980 terabytes of data on S3, and I have probably some Dynamo and, and uh, RDS on Amazon. The rest of that, the rest of my company runs off, off of Hobbies. So what do I do? I run the cloud that has all the Jenkins built in. It has all my upgrades, it has all my patches, it has everything. Run cloud. What run cloud gives me is frictionless, scalability, auto scale, SSL. I get new relic out of the box. I get paper trail, I get send grid. They have a huge amount of enterprise partners in there, right? So it's all under a click away. What I do on Amazon is there, and we use a sound trouble and things like this. Okay? So today we have over 55 applications running on, on run cloud. Okay? You have why 55 applications? And we'll talk about some scaling now. The reason you do 55 applications is because if you everybody talks about microservices, I, I don't like talking about microservices that much because they're just they're not just a service, right? So if you if you bought into the API and you build your company using your own APIs, then it actually grows. So back to continuous development. If, I'm, if we have two people working on some things, they're disjoined and can be put back together, right? This is one of our, I call this my money app, right? I have three apps that run this way. These apps, out of the box, so I will tell you, this took me all of five minutes to set up. Out of the box, I'm running a large, right? I have five minutes running, and it scales to 20. If you use the console, it only lets you pick them, but if you use the API, it will choose 20. So, at any point in time, when somebody sends an email that I know about, like United sends an email saying, download a free song this week, right? I don't have to do anything. I didn't wake up, my dead box guy was gonna called. It automatically scaled up, I didn't do anything. And if you look at this feature here, the new feature for, out, for Amazon Auto Scale, I think copied a lot of what uh, CloudBees does here. Right? This is a one screenshot. I pick a button, I pick a few do drop downs. There is some sort of getting used to the bottom piece there on when to scale up and when to scale down and the cool off period, but you'll learn based on your app. To add paper trail and to add new relic, I just click two buttons, because once you have a configured one, it's configured always. The other big thing for us was logging. On logging side, I will tell you, this is, this is a big big feature. If you want a blameless, blameless uh, front dev team, you have to log everything. Now, logging has become very expensive and very time consuming, so what we do in our shop is, you log everything and then allow, allow you to turn off the, the log you don't want, right? So it can be super verbose or very minimal. So when you write those log, into logs, let's say we have a, a weird case where we're seeing this new relic piece come up, and we're not sure how to fix that. And we're saying we don't have the logs for that because when it happens, so I'll turn on the logs for whatever I think that's causing that, so the next time it happens, I have a full log, right? There's some things that you, sometimes are, that you'll find, sometimes you won't, right? That's the, that's, that's the truth, right? But if you have the money to, to afford to go to, I mean, I'm, right now, I'm doing about eight and a half gig a month, months of logs. You know, I think the next one is at 30 gigs. Um, we, might, we might go there soon. We go to 60 apps. And so the problem with logging and the, and the usefulness of logging is, again, it's, it's no blame game. The, log, the truth is in the logs. The truth is in the data, right? When there's a problem, let's go check the logs, right? I don't want guessing. I don't want, uh, I think. I will tell you, this is the, the cool thing about people's gut, right? They're usually right. But it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. Because even if you're right, I need the data and the logs to fix it, right? We need to see what the course of action is. So just because you say, I think it is, uh, most of the time, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, my developers and myself are right on that. But being right doesn't solve my problem. I gotta solve the problem. And without the logs, I can't solve the problem, right? And that's where, I think it's this, and sure enough, it's that, but the logs will tell you how to fix it. If you tie your logs to new relic, I don't know how many, how many people here use new relic or, or uh, app dynamics. I would tell you, this is the most magnificent tool in the world, this new relic tool. 
If you're on Cloudbees today and you're on the hosted Cloudbees on Run, you get it for free out of the box. You get a free, a free version of New Relic. That will give you, I would say, about 80% of what you need for New Relic. So it's, it's out of the box. I don't pay anything extra for New Relic. I only pay uh, extra for New Relic on two of my, what we call the money apps, which might find um, the, the two big APIs that we use for external customers. So here's the other part of building business. If you push code, that means if you actually write code at a company, if you push it to a branch and it's getting a build, you're on call, right? And you see, coming from the ops world, where I had lots and lots of uh, previous nights, right, to find out that it's bad code or bad SQL, right? Um, here, if you wrote the code and you're on call, it's your job to look at it, to allow to fix it or find the guy that is, because being on call, Back to not having any heroes or any sucky guys, right? Everybody should be able to look at the code, what's wrong, and get the appropriate info on. And then I don't want the whole sport right then and there. If you fix the problem on the next business day, you can write a post mortem and the whole team is involved in the post mortem. That's the biggest piece also, because that's a learning experience that you as a dev will get. Because hopefully there's a senior guy that probably said, Oh, I knew what that was right away, because he has the gut piece, it's the data. But he should bring it back to the team. Because he wants to go on vacation one day, he's going to be in a national park for a week. He, we can't find who he, where he is, which somebody should be able to fix that, right? That's where we're back to no heroes and no zeros, right? You want somebody in the middle. You want team players that can think outside the box and constantly innovate. Now, we do a lot of cool things with feature flags, right? So, here's what happens, right? I write a feature that, that needs one of those other apps to be ready, but it's not ready yet. But we push daily, right? 20 or 30 times. So I'm not waiting. It gets pushed to the feature flag, right? That's how this works. Because by turning on feature flags, I just showed you a, a 28 of one of the database queries this morning. It's just a true or not true or false, or you know, it's it's just very simple. Because what that allows you to do is test things or push things that are not ready yet. Because your part's done, but the other part isn't ready. But by pushing into production, there, you, you receive a lot of benefits, which I'll get to on the next slide. How many people here do one push, one build, deploy the menus? Does anybody know what this even means? Okay, so I don't know if you can see the bottom of the screen. So on this build here, right, I'm saying build two versions of this app, right? And you see that they're running on Cloudbees, so you see a little cloud Cloudbees on the bottom of that screen. And one of them has one URL, one of them has a second URL. The first URL has all the features turned on, the second URL doesn't have the features turned on. So what does that allow me to do? Here's where I, I do things that Cloudy doesn't want me to tell you, but I'm going to tell you anyways, right? There's a thing called the private apps. I mean, I, for the guys running on Cloudy's, the private app gives me a front door. So what does that do for me? On that feature set where I turn it all on, I tell the client, here's a login, go to that page, and try the new feature sets, right? Because what happens is sometimes, if you all work with clients, and I'll tell you this is where the you know, rubber meets the road. How many people here work with external clients in the room, right? So most of their stuff will never be as fast as you if you're running DevOps. If you're running against big corporations like Fortune 500, like our I do, their push cycle sometimes are four months. If I had to wait four months to push a feature, I would never get anything done, right? So we push the feature flag. When you're ready, you tell me, I'll turn the feature flag on. But what it allows us to do is let the client test that in a way where his part isn't ready. So he can see the flow, he can see the interaction, right? He can see the marketing part, because it's marketing is a big piece of that. That allows that piece to happen pretty quickly, right? So this feature flag for us and the private apps on CloudBees allows us to do a quick build, quick push. You email the client, here's the link. The bottom link is the private link. The top link is actually the, the real URL for production, this app, right? He goes to test it. If he takes up six weeks to get back, I don't care. Because it's pushed to production. The feature flag is turned on, I don't have to worry about it. I continue working on the application, right? That's why you can't be half pregnant, either you're DevOps or not. These are, these are the things where, where we've made conscious decisions to say, if it's something they can push today, push it today. If it's something they push tomorrow, what happens? Technical debt, work in progress. It becomes another thing you need to do this. And the day you have to push it for real, you say, oh, I forgot that part. And that's where it kills you, right? This is where this, everybody, this is where the non dev guys say this is where it doesn't work. Right? When you, when you forget something, they come down with continuous development sucks, you need better QA. Being that I, I was a security guy, and being that I, I know a lot about QA, QA and security have a lot of the same sort of characteristics. I will tell you that. It's all fear, right? 
your security theater, your QA theater. I will tell you, unfortunately, unless you're working on some huge financial application, or if you're running my heart monitor, right? I don't think it needs six weeks of QA. If you're working on a project that takes more than 10 weeks, run with the same place you ran with the specs, with a four page spec, right? Because this is a, you know, you know, this, I, I go camping and hiking, and I do summer I go hiking, and so, how many, how many people have been hiking here before, or gone to a long, like, long walk or national park? And you know, you're waiting for that payoff. Halfway through that hike, you're going, shh, shh, shh. I'm gonna say that right. You're going, should I turn back? Is it really worth the payoff? You know, I'm, I'm an hour and 40 minutes into this, and this, this bridge, this natural bridge, or, you know, this waterfall better have the payoff, right? <laughs> when you have a project more than 10 weeks, that's where your developers get to. They're thinking, should I turn back? Should I move forward? And it's psychological, right? Because I'm working on, at that moment in time, you've made sausage bacon in there, right? They're coming in and just coding, just to get the code done. Right, because they don't know when the, when the end is coming. But if you have, say, everything takes 10 weeks, max. So most of our projects internally take about two and a half to four weeks. I will tell you that there's projects that we do, and there's projects that everybody will do here, that will take longer than 10 weeks. And those projects suck. Right? So you have to, what we do is we chop it up in cycles to not make it suck so much. Right? Um, it's, I will tell you, if you're changing from, from one database to another database, you can't do it in 10 weeks. Right? If you're changing technologies, you can't do it in 10 weeks. Those are the rare exceptions. But if you're working on a feature and it's more than 10 weeks, you go over engineer it. Right? And today's code is, like computing, code is cheap. If you spend 10 weeks working on a feature, then you're going to throw away six months because the web changes like that. Right? If you spend 10 weeks on the edge, it's going to be dead in six months. You've over designed it. You've over, you know, you've over engineered it. And what happens, we're all smart. Everybody in this room is very smart to be here, right? And think, oh, how about this use case? You know, uh, last time I was having dinner with uh, Sasha and Steve Harrison. Sasha showed me this guy in the elevator that kept hitting the elevator. And actually went through the elevator and fell down. And I said, well, now they're changing all the elevator rules. And I go, that's not a use case I would ever test for. If you ran into an elevator on a shopping cart, right, four or five times, and you fall through the elevator shaft, that shouldn't be something you should be testing for. That's so rare, you know. But that being said, everybody always, all the programmers take the happy path. You know, everybody talks about the happy path, nothing happens on the happy path either. So, again, there's the guy in the cart going through the elevator, and the happy path. The truth is somewhere in the middle. That's why most of the QA we do is let clients use it, let users test it, do A-B testing. Does anybody do A-B testing here at all? Okay, so with A-B testing, the feature set, you can turn the feature on for an hour and say, did it change what I wanted to, right? Um, let's say we're trying to get more enrollments in some sort of flow. You know, our, our highest rate for this website is X amount, is S, you know, it's at 3 o'clock in the day or 4 o'clock in the day. We'll turn that feature on for an hour and see how it performs. Did we get what we wanted? Right, did it do what we wanted? Is it a problem? Right? If it sucks, I can turn it off and roll it right. I don't roll it back because it's turned off. There's no rollback. I can fix it tomorrow and push it again. Rollback is only when the shit hits the fan, right? And if you're using on cloud bees, uh, and I'll show you some stuff up to the, my last slide here. It's it's super simple. You click on the last release, you push push it. It, it automatically starts up ten boxes or whatever amount of boxes I have configured. It puts the new code out there, and when it's ready, it does a swap for me. I didn't do anything. That's what cloud bees does for me on that on that side of things. How many of you here are working on mobile apps? I say mobile is a teacher, if you haven't heard that. You slash. Yeah, yeah. Amazon has a new phone today, so if it, it isn't a feature, I don't know we'll Amazon has a new phone today that uh, it's going to help you shop better, I think. But now we're doing iOS builds on, on, with Jenkins and on Cloudbees, where I can actually test on Cloudbees. And if you see KK, KK has a paper, a blog post that he has on iOS builds, and actually, if you if you go out to the, I want to say it's mobile.cloudbees.com, they actually have two apps you can download, right, uh, to play with the framework. It shows you the builds, shows you an app, shows you how you can do all the API, the SNS messaging, everything you see on the slide is basically out of there, okay? And so, I'm gonna, that's my last question, that's my last thing, so. Can you go back two slides that I want to ask about the A-B testing for particular features? Can you do yeah. that by region and then uh, expand it by region, or is that in the works? Or? So one of the cool things we have, so I'll tell you some, two things we do. We have an app, 
um, that we, we call our uh, code play app, which is like, it's basically a code, you get something like an iTunes, you know, when you go to Starbucks, you get a card with a thing on it. So we have that for multiple clients. So what we'll do is some of the bigger clients, we won't, we won't do any testing on them, but on some of the small clients we'll do. On United, on other clients like that, we'll do it at a time of the day. Or I can say, um, some of the things we do, and we'll, this is where some of the sophistication we don't have yet, uh, is picking by region, right? Um, because we're basically all in the east, and uh, we're in the east, uh, A and B and C, so um, there's not no a hard way for me to actually do the testing. But there are some new tools, again, I'm not going to build it because I was going to build it, and I just found a tool that allowed me to do that. So basically, let me inject the code and pick what I show the user on that piece of framing testing. Um, that's something we're actually working on on uh, one of the apps that we're designing that's coming out. Um, but again, if, if you don't want to wait to that point yet, I would tell you use it as a feature set. Turn it on, test it for an hour, and turn it back off. I mean, this, it's, it's, and then if you do it at the time you want to, you're going to see in the work network, I can roll it back immediately because it's a database change, right? It's just like it's going off, right? I don't have to wait until in the morning to find out that it crashed and everybody has to come on the phone and we have to have everybody on Skype going, you know, what happens, right? That's what you want to sort of save yourself from, right? Is let yourself turn it on, let yourself turn it off. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. So if I want to test in Australia, I do it at 2 a.m. Yeah, you do it at 3 a.m. So we, there's, um, there's like some of our ingestion, so talk a little bit about, our, we have this ingestion process where the studios, the music studios, deliver <coughs> tons and tons of metadata, probably like gigabytes of metadata a day. Um, and so, depending on how much I got last night, that dog run four hours, it's like four minutes. So there's times where I want to test some of those things, where I'll hold that queue and test it in the morning. So if something happens, I can, I can again, test some features and roll it back and say that rollback is not feature, right? So for us, rollback means turn the feature off. It sucks, but you know, we'll try to get it. Right, so I don't, there's no rollback because the code's already committed. Right, let people continue developing into that piece. Let people continue moving forward. Okay. Um, what I can do here is, is that I'm open for questions. I wanted to answer already, so if there was technical, technical questions, I could have time to answer them. Um, I can show you some of the things I do on, I mean, uh, I don't know how many people have seen this. It's hard for me to see what's on that screen. The record player. Yeah, you someone just see a browser. This browser. Try to get back to why I get this ready. Other questions? Yeah, Mario. So you you talked about um, using hosted with cloudies. So like, what was the value you got out of having the host versus running it yourself? I never have to worry about patching it. I never have to worry about do I have enough do I have enough executors to do my tankers jobs. I never have to worry about do I have enough apps to run my app. Do I have enough servers to run my, my app? It's again. I would say it's very, very, um, it, for us it's, it's very, it's cheap because what we're back to, you have to value your time versus the time somebody else's time, right? So if, if I'm cheap, the difference that I pay Cloud used to run my Jenkins and to run my servers, I'll do that all day long because I'm not worrying about this JBoss patched. I'm not worrying about, you know, what, what, what version of Tomcat I'm running on. I'm not worrying about any of that, right? Um, I'm not worrying about if I need more. If I need more executors, right? Sometimes when I, I have a three-hour job that I need to run faster, I just pay more and say put it on the bigger server, right? It's a it's a button I push. I, I'll handle it later, right? So it's it's a cost of two pizzas. So you tell me I, I can have my staff wait for four hours or spend my cost of two pizzas to that make it happen immediately, right? But those are the things you can do to sort of make that happen. And that's some of the things that I get from cloud these on, on that side of hosting Jenkins, right? It's again. I'm not saying it's impossible to do yourself. I just don't want to do it myself, right? You should, again, if it's not core to your business, you shouldn't do it because your competitor will catch up quickly because he's not doing it. 
So if you look at this delta, all these companies have caught up pretty quickly, and all these disruptors, is because, like anybody, anybody else, they have to carry all that baggage that came with it, right? Like I say, I'm gonna start tomorrow, I'm gonna use Amazon, I'm gonna use Relic, I'm gonna use a hosted, uh, you know, um, whatever, whatever, whatever service you want, you know, we, I wrote my own version of search on my tool, right? I told, I will tell you that when I started, when I started Truth Digital, I had as probably me and my, uh, my, my these architects and Darren, probably had probably 10,000 hours, maybe 15,000 hours of search, and probably another 15,000 hours of search after that. When Amazon announced that cloud search was coming out, I dumped, I, I dumped two years of domain knowledge out the window because I didn't want to do it anymore. Because they're never gonna have a, I'm never gonna have a skill Amazon's gonna have. I'm never gonna have a feature set, so I have two choices. Do I want to become a search company? Am I gonna compete with Google or Amazon? No. So I do it, right? At that point in time I said, there's a product that's better than mine. We wrote a timeline saying, in 11 weeks, we're getting off of search, right? And we did it seven weeks in, so we, we put it on our two smaller clients, and then two weeks in, we put it on the rest of the clients. AB feature, it was a feature site. The feature was called Old Search, New Search. And it was that simple, right? And we moved everything to Dynamo, we moved everything off of, um, you know, again, I'll tell you, the stack I used was pretty, at the time, it was pretty impressive. But you can't follow the technology. That's the other problem with developers. They follow the technology. They want to reuse it and reuse it and reuse it. You know, you, we have to change that mindset in this room, right? Code is cheap. Compute is cheap, right? Get over it, right? It's not your wife or your girlfriend. Move on, right? <laughs> yeah, you, there's, no, there's no baggage here, you know? And it, it, it's not a pride issue because developers, I mean, we're, we're all, you know, I don't want to talk about the room, but you know, if you're a geek or a nerd, we have this value that, you know, this is my like, baby, I have so much into it. Yeah. But you know what? Your next thing will be 10 times better. Move on. Let it go. Right? Some, some, I was just, some of the heroes carry all this code with them. I wrote this thing, this awesome, you know, business role engine. We should use it. When did you write it? Four years ago. I don't want it. I guess it's wrong four years ago. It's, it's not going to scale, right? Everything made the scale here. Right. Um, one of the other things I will talk about is back to your question on. It's not only cloud users. I mean, I, I would tell you there's things that I don't do. I mean, um, there's some things like off, like it's like um, like you know my phone system at work. I don't, I don't, I don't even have a phone system at work anymore. I am a certified Cisco engineer. I, I have a cloud. Yeah, you know, I can do Cisco telephony in my sleep. I can buy one on Craigslist for like a hundred bucks and run it. But there's the problem, I have to make a choice. I can spend six hours fixing this problem, like when my mom calls for a computer, or I can be coding the next feature, right? Once you make everybody in, your, in the room, every developer, right, part of what makes the company the bottom line move forward, they'll start thinking like that, right? I have two choices. I can spend five hours fixing this phone, or I can just, you know what, have somebody else worry about it. Because that's not gonna bring any value to my company. If I have me and one of my top engineers trying to figure out why the phone's not working, that we're not coding. And if I'm not coding, I'm not building, I'm not building, I'm not making money. I'm not differentiating myself from the guys that copy me, right? Because the thing with a startup is, you know, this is one of the things that you guys have learned in this room. Having a good idea is nothing, right? It's executing. Executing is what makes companies, right? And the difference with executing is saying, I have no baggage, I can move forward, I can take criticism, and I can move on and build better, right? And again, if it's not part of your core, don't do it because no matter how many people you tell me about my phone system or, or search or how I host Jenkins, it doesn't matter because I'm not going to beat iTunes or Amazon by if I have better Jenkins implementation than they do, right? And that's not going to make a difference. It's how fast are my guys thinking about the next feature or making you buy more music or making you watch more movies? Or that's what makes a difference. If you're selling widgets, everything should be about selling a widget, right? Jenkins is just a tool to get you to sell more widgets. Get over it, automate it, and start innovating. If it's not core to your business, don't do it. Um, I, I mean, I will tell you that at the height when I was a CIO for a public company, CIO, CTO, I had like 900 servers and 40 data centers. I never want that again in my lifetime. Because just the OpEx and the CapEx, forget about that. It's, it, it, we're just saying in a box. Back to the, if you're developers, so back to the developer, how I started this and I'll end it, and I think we're all good on time. Well, when I hear about this where people are developing, you know, well, my, my developer builds his own build, and he's running Jenkins on his own box, and he has his own build locally. That, it's not good for me. It's not good for anybody in the room. Because 
when you have to tell somebody, I'm doing a build to production, right? And the, the you know, I, if you want, I can't unplug into the same thing. I can't just But if you look at some of our Jenkins uh, tests, they're pretty, pretty, I would say, heavy. The better the test, the better the coder. That was, that's the other thing is. If your guy writes good tests, the better he'll, the more he'll sleep he'll have in his lifetime. So all that has to happen is you've got to get what's open up with the night on page two, you say, here, go fix this, and you can write better tests. Um, I think, and um, I think if you look at most of our jobs today on those, more than half the compute time runs on test on the build. Um, so like KK said earlier today about you know having that rollback, that's a feature I, I'm gonna love. Oops, I'm gonna love because that allows me to do those, those three hour jobs, I don't have to roll back to the beginning. Because usually what happens is my you know, something happened with my demo box or something happened on S3 and I have to look and roll back. But we spend a lot more time now on our jobs on testing side than, than the real side. So any other questions? You can, I'll be here after if you want any questions. I'll have stickers for you for you guys to turn in your trivia cards. Turn in your trivia cards. Uh, thank you guys.